what does a publisher look for in uh, in a new comic book submission? Ooh. Hey guys, uh, welcome to Inside Comics with uh, George McHale. Uh, really quick, if you like this kind of content, uh, subscribe and uh, tell a friend about it. Uh, today, my guest is uh, Source Point Press CCO, Josh Werner. Josh, thanks for being on the show. I'm so happy to be here, man. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Josh, I, I wanted to talk to you about what does a publisher look for in, uh, in a new comic book submission? Oof. So um, I want to give a little bit of context so that people know what, to, what they're seeing on the other side of the table because uh, it is kind of this gap, this weird void where you just assume there's like a person waiting and that they grab it and read it. Uh, so uh, we have a like a new submissions department where we have uh, basically we took away, we stripped away some power from a couple of us, myself included, which is probably for the best. Um, so that there is like a process now where people kind of have to go through uh, general review, because what we get is we get a big mix of, we get people who are like, I have an idea for a comic. We get people who say, I have uh, the first issue of a script done, and it's like a 50 issue long series that I promise I'm going to write the rest of it. And I don't have an artist yet, but I thought maybe you guys would take care of that for me. We get that. And then we get um, fully finished like projects that are sometimes have been published, sometimes have been kickstarted, sometimes have never seen the light of day and they've just been banking the issues as they rack them up. Um, and, and then once in a while we'll get, uh, we'll get more complex pitches, um, which are things that, that fall outside of creator owned content and involve maybe licenses or um, special kind of uh, partnerships uh, or localization of things from other countries or, um, or crossover between different types of mediums. So like that's a little bit different animal, but we get loads of these. Uh, right now we have uh, 200, a little over 200 submissions that are in queue for the next big review round. And then the main thing that we have to do is we have to look at our uh, publishing schedule going forward for so long, we have to look at uh, where the project is, try to figure out uh, how close to completion it is, when it's going to be complete. And those need to be really solid answers for us to even consider it. It doesn't matter how much we like it. If we don't know when it's going to be done, we don't know how to plan for it. And it's not because of the content. It's because of our schedule. So for example, um, we've done uh, Hank Steiner is like a Frankenstein's monster noir detective, right? Uh, I am not opposed to the idea of publishing another Frankenstein related comic book, but I would never want to publish them at the same time. And I wouldn't want them to be within a few months of each other either. I'd want to kind of like push those uh, out a little bit. And that becomes a big problem. We're trying to schedule things all the way through. Right now we're in the middle of scheduling 2022. It doesn't mean that this year won't change or you have additions, but for the most part, we've got something plotted out and say, if things go the way they should, this should all line up. Um, so we're looking for things that we know are definitely close to completion or have a very clear path to completion. And it's realistic, not pipe dream stuff. We, we've seen teams that like, oh, they took a year to do issue one, but they promised they can do issue two in 30 days. That's um, if they just have this publishing contract. That's not realistic. And we've, we've fallen into that boat before. So a lot of times what we need is we need a good portion of it finished, even if it's on like a loose green light or like we're interested, if you can get most of it finished by around this time, then we know we can fit into our schedule or something like that. Uh, so it's not always whether or not it's good. You know, a lot of times it has to do with whether or not it competes with or, or, or detracts from what something else or too similar to something else we're already publishing. And then other things we're looking for is um, uh, something kind of marketable sellable, relatable, with a twist that fits within some of the genres that we've been publishing and that we know we have an audience for, or maybe pushes the boundaries beyond that little bit and we know that there's a reason why we should take that risk. And that means a risk on fronting the money for the books, a risk on the mon money for the marketing, a risk on the creator's uh, behalf as well. And we need to know that we're a good fit. So if we know that the, the people bringing the project to the table are gonna bring an audience with them as well. It, it takes that risk and it makes it smaller. It makes us more likely to try something new. 
um, that we haven't had prior success for that we can't kind of gauge and calculate how it'll fit in with our months. So for example, just to keep the lights on in here, we have to have, say we do 10, we do about 10 titles, between 10 and 12 titles every month. Um, at least a few of those have to be home runs uh, to keep the lights on. And so if we were willing to take a risk on things that we don't necessarily plan on being home run sales wise, but we think are important to our brand, to our core audience, uh, or that we just truly believe in and we just really want to kind of lift the voices of these creators, um, we're willing to take that risk and accept some lower sales uh, titles as long as it falls in a month where we know there's some title that's going to kind of help bring our print run up. Um, and that's going to help all books. So any, any successful title will help out a title that's less successful that month in making, the, making it have an okay profit margin to make sure we can get those royalties to the creator. Uh, because the more books you print, the, the, the lower the cost of print is and it kind of helps everything all around. So marketability. And then the other thing too is really the creators. Um, we're really picky. Uh, we, we do take a look at social media accounts. Uh, we want to know that you have them and that you're using them and that you're using them respectfully, properly, that you have a good outtake on things, the outlook. You want to we look for positive people who are kind of excited and passionate and not uh, complaining about the industry all the time. Um, these are like all things we put in a big pot and stew. And, it, you know, sometimes like a hit artist and a brand new writer can be together. And we totally take that into account. We're like, well, established artist, new writer, it's going to balance itself out to be a good team. Um, and then how are they with promoting? Great, because we need all the help we can get being as small as we are. Uh, it's definitely a team effort. And on behalf of the creative team and what we do, and we're getting better every month. Um, our press is building and we're finding new avenues of ways to market. And, uh, and most recently, we, um, we just signed a deal with Simon & Schuster. So uh, trade paperback collected editions are now going to be in stores um, internationally around the globe and offered to booksellers. So now we start looking at things in terms a little bit differently. Everything before was based on how successful will this be in comic book shops? And then when they weren't successful in comic book shops, we would find our success at conventions. And, uh, and then COVID-19 hit and wiped us out of conventions. And we were doing um, over 70 a year, which sometimes meant being in four different places at once just to pull it off. And, uh, that was our main resource for uh, income. So we have to kind of think a little bit differently now, like how well will this do in comic shops is now much, much more important to us. And how do we reach out to retailers in advance and like make sure that they're on board and that they know about it, that they're aware, that they know exactly when the cutoff points are and that they're, they're gonna place those orders and how to help them make the customers more aware. And then now we have this new way of thinking about it as well will the trade paperback collected edition be successful in bookstores? So sometimes we can now look at our submissions a little bit differently uh, from a different standpoint and say, while maybe conventions won't be coming back as heavily, as quickly, as soon as we'd like, we can start looking at different avenues for sales. So if this is likely to do okay in comic book stores, will the collected edition do well in bookstores? Um, and that could change our view on things too. Because right now for indie publishers, uh, the trade paperback collected editions are actually not the top selling, the, the comic book shops are not the top selling place for them, uh, which is, might be surprising to people, but most comic book stores are stocking the same exact trades over and over again. So what they see on the shelf is, you know, <laughs> the killing joke and uh, Watchmen and just like home run hits that have been adapted into other things that are always going to sell over and over and over and people will come looking for them always that's what they're willing to put money on and put on a shelf because shelf space is so important to them if they put indie titles on a shelf they have to be really picky because there's numerous per month that come out if they tried to buy one of each half their store would be full of giant risk and now like every square foot of that shop has to pay for itself in sales and if suddenly 12 square feet of bookshelf are not moving quick enough they just won't make that mistake again they won't order the trades so sometimes we'll have a hit comic series it'll sell out every single issue. People will be dying to read the trade and comic book stores will still not go in heavy on the trade because the higher MSRP item, there's a higher risk. They'll only order it if someone specifically asks them to. And then it, does, it never makes the shelf, it goes in a pull box, which is very different from having that shelf presence. So right now for anybody that's not the big two or three or four, um, booksellers are a 
new avenue for those trade sales that are actually outselling comic book shops for the first time in history, probably. Uh, so we have to really take it seriously and consider pushing our marketing efforts in different directions now. Um, so whether or not we feel it'll be good as a graphic novel in a bookstore, it now affects the way we look at submissions too. That was probably way long of an, too long of an answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, getting back to um, what uh, publishers look for in uh, submissions. I don't know if you know this about me, but I worked as an associate editor at uh, Comic Stream, which was a startup company and they were going to be producing uh, original comic book content. And uh, so I would receive uh, submissions myself. And one thing I would tell uh, kind of people new to the industry would be to make sure your art is killer. Yeah. <laughs> because that's like the first thing. Like if you yeah. would buy the book, you know, then you got to hire a different artist. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to find a, a bigger budget somehow, you know, <laughs> and, and, and get an artist that's really going to, deliver because that's the first thing that uh, that any publisher looks at is like okay is this art up to snuff yeah they they might not even get to reading it if they've already decided they don't like the art yeah. um, i wouldn't read it like if i didn't like the art i wouldn't read it that was that so was it's the number one uh after that i would say lettering is incredibly important i've seen in just phenomenal books get ruined by the lettering because it was a scenario where uh uh, they just thought they could do it themselves. And sometimes they can, don't get me wrong. I've seen writers who are phenomenal letterers um, and they, they, they understand the craft and they understand uh, lettering such a, it's an art form of its own and it's a very different art form from writing because it has a visual presence. Your writing now has a visual presence and uh, understanding layout and, and how much dialogue and narration should be on a page is, is a visual craft uh, and seeing it done poorly can totally ruin a book. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about this uh, deal with uh, Simon & Schuster, because that, that's uh, pretty huge news here. And, and what does that mean for the company uh, as far as like people being able to access the SourcePoint Press books, maybe in bookstores or in other countries, or, or what, is, what does that look like? So that is, it, you're, it, you're right, it's a very big news drop and it just happened um, last week we just announced it it's been a deal that's been in the works for months and the first portion of it involves our backlist so we have a, a very we've been around long enough now where we have a really big backlist which basically means we got a giant warehouse full of graphic novels <laughs> and uh, there's some really good ones in there but because comic book stores are very very focused on whatever's coming out this month backlist doesn't mean anything to them so they tend to move slowly, it, usually conventions would be our big outlet. So the first step in our new uh, distribution agreement with them is that they are taking on a big chunk of our backlist and they're putting it in the warehouse and their sales teams are already working on making all of those titles available in all sorts of different places. So this includes populating you know, popular sites. So you'll start to see that more of our titles popping up on Amazon, uh, barnesandnoble.com and, um, uh, loads and loads of like uh, booksellers who primarily sell online will start seeing this and having it. And this gives the, those shops and, and booksellers an opportunity, the ones who sell online, to grab something straight from Simon & Schuster, put it up for sale. If you were to order it from them, Simon & Schuster will then get them that book. It takes some of the risk away from them having to you know, buy and then resell, uh, which is great for especially some of the smaller businesses. And then uh, for physical bookstores, um, this means it is now uh, in their go-to catalogs that they can go to and order from all around the world. And it means that because Simon & Schuster will be just splitting these up amongst their warehouses instead of ours being centrally focused in Saginaw, Michigan, they're able to get them to bookstores quicker. It's, uh, it's huge. It's really big, especially since their reach and uh, their sales teams are just much more effective than anything we could ever do. They're uh, the biggest book distributor in the world. And we have had uh, some books available through, uh, through Ingram in the past. And this is different from that. Um, the, the, it, this agreement will give bookstores more power. So these bookstores will have the ability to uh, return books that don't sell after a long time. They'll have the ability to get, to make more money off of selling one. Uh, so they have more incentive to try to put it on their bookshelf. So uh, if they're not going to make very much by putting on their bookshelf and waiting for it to sell, 
they're not going to put it on their bookshelf. They're only going to order it when somebody specifically asks. This deal will, uh, will give them a nice chunk of the margin and really incentivize reasons to start putting SourcePoint Press on bookstore shelves. And that's, um, that's the next big step. So now as a company, a small company, we have to kind of learn how to start marketing differently for them, you know, for an audience we weren't previous, previously focused on. Uh, we're so, so focused on comic book store retailers. And also make sure that we're not going to take anything away from comic book shops, that they remain our, our core audience. And uh, that's where the heart of this industry is. And that's who we want to, to keep in business the most. So we have to make sure that we are adding on to our efforts and not splitting them. But for the most part, it means uh, there's a chance you could walk into Barnes and Noble and start seeing us uh, in the graphic novel section, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Simon & Schuster is owned by CBS Viacom. Yeah. You know, Paramount. Is there a connection kind of brewing there? Uh, so far, the only thing I've gotten to take away from that, which is kind of interesting, is that uh, there's a portal that I log into when I'm uh, uploading assets and things like that. And I'm actually logging into a CBS portal, which is super weird for me. I'm like, oh, this feels neat. Um, but no, not at this time. But the good thing is we are developing relationships at Simon & Schuster all over the place. And we're getting to know people. We're holding regularly meetings. I've, I've already been in about a dozen Simon & Schuster meetings. And um, all of that stuff is very interconnected all the way down to, uh, they have printing facilities they partner with, they have their own publishing services, and then they have opportunities for multimedia expansion, um, potentially should our relationships continue to be fostered and grow there. Um, so you never know, you never know what that could mean. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell me about uh, some of the titles that are currently uh, you know, in previews uh, from so uh, SourcePoint Press. So if, uh, if our viewers wanna go out to the store and, and, and get those books brought in for them, or maybe they're on the, sh on the, on the shelves right now, uh, what should they be looking for? Uh, so right now, um, if you aren't familiar with Broken Gargoyles, it was kind of like a hit mini series that we put out late last year. Uh, this is the time to jump on board because there is a trade paperback collected edition that's available for stores to pre-order right now. So you can get the entire first volume. Uh, it's, uh, it's only 10 bucks, it's 9.99. So low MSRP and um, it has cover art by me um, that was previously only available. That cover art was only available on a very rare variant of issue one. So it's kind of cool to see that it's gonna you know, be available to more people now who just like that piece of art. Uh, and that is uh, a really, it's a really good time to pre-order it because uh, volume two is kicking off next month. It, it'll be able to uh, be pre-ordered issue one of volume two. So I highly recommend that one. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Cult of Dracula number three is in previews right now. This is, uh, this means that Cult of Dracula number one, the way that the, the pre-order schedule works is hitting stores right now. That, uh, and by no, right now, I mean the last Wednesday of this month, but uh, this month. So, if anybody's into uh, horror and vampires and also psychological horror and a very fresh take on, on Dracula that kind of dives into deep lore. And uh, for those who know SourcePoint and our, our horror titles, this is very much in the vein of what we do, then um, you'll really dig it. I highly recommend it. Uh, issue one, uh, retailers went in heavy on, so you, there's a good chance you'll find it in your local shop. Uh, if you can't though, um, definitely hit up our web store and then you can start telling your local shop to put it on your pull list right now and they can get you one, two, and three all lined up. Um, the covers on the uh, Cult of Dracula, they're just- Cool, right? <laughs> we got some phenomenal artists on there. The, if you're interested, if you're a collector looking for variants, I, there's loads of retailer exclusive variants. We only put two covers out through Diamond, but there are several covers available if you hunt uh, for them and there's some gorgeous ones. Um, there is uh, Damn Cursed Children number five is the final issue of Damn Cursed Children. This has been such a fun horror series. It's, uh, it's kind of like The Walking Dead meets Village of the Damned, I would say. If you're a horror fan, it's, it is true classic in your face horror. It's like everything a horror movie, like movie buff would want. Um, awesome, awesome team. And who's uh, been featured on your show, which is super cool. Uh, so that's the final issue. 
if you are, I basically, if, you, if you're reading it, I just don't want you to miss out on the final issue. So make sure it's on your pull list and people know to get four and five, but five is available for stores to, to, you're making that call within the next couple of weeks. So they have to know now whether or not people want number five and you're gonna want to, it's phenomenal. Um, classic Pulp Ghosts. So Classic Pulp is a series that I do. It is, uh, it's literally curated pulp that I handpick from the forties and um, what this is, is, I do little one-shot collections. Um, they're really fun. Uh, they're, they're short comic stories. And then I find other additional matter that I kind of sneak in there that's really cool. Like in the detectives issue, there's all sorts of like how to be a detective or solve this mystery, turn the page upside down and learn the answer, things like that. Um, these are basically incredibly hard to find comic stories that are no longer in print. Uh, the publishers are long gone. And the only way you're going to be able to read them is if you own a extremely rare valuable copy that you probably don't want to touch you probably want to you know encase in plastic and never read or you um have a time machine it's one or the other so uh basically what i do is i look for uh, super heavily damaged copies that are still available and uh or that someone owns in their private collection and i work with them to get super high res scans of these and then i repair water damage i repair uh, tape, tears, crayon marks, all that stuff. I basically sit there and I repaint these pages until they're restored as closely as possible to what the original printing looked like. And they're really fun. So uh, this issue is all about ghost stories. Uh, if you're into old school EC style horror, it's probably right up your alley. That um, sounds like a labor of love. It is, yeah. They only come out once in a blue moon because uh, they're definitely like a side project that I just do because I'm really passionate about it. And of, about that era and that material being available to people to read. And another thing that I'm passionate about too is, um, is crediting the original teams who worked on them. So in the forties, uh, a lot of times uh, writers and artists were not getting credit properly. Sometimes you'd see uh, like the writer get credit and then no credit for the artist. And usually the letterer was a whole nother person uh, that never got credit. And sometimes there were two artists, you know, there's somebody doing colors and inks and things like that. So I spend a lot of time trying to research. And then at the beginning of each issue, I tell you, this is what I was able to come up with for who the creative team was on each of these stories. If I know, or if I feel confident about it, and this goes as far as like contacting, you know, great grandchildren and stuff and being like, I have a theory that your grandfather worked on this. Can you, you know, tell me if I'm right? Like that, it goes that far. So it takes a long time for me to do these. And, uh, and then I put it together. If I still don't know who did the story, I say that it's still unknown, but uh, it's fun. It's really fun. I, and so far everybody's, they, they've all sold really well. So I'm really happy uh, and it makes me want to keep doing it. So uh, we'll probably do a collected edition later this year of the first four and, uh, and there's more on the way, but Ghost is available right now. Um, Touching Evil Volume 2 is available to pre-order the trade paperback. That's a, a, a phenomenal series that is uh, up to issue 14 right now, I think. Um, it's our longest running comic series we've ever done. And we're really proud of that. Uh, usually for a small press company our size, uh, this is right around the time where like the sales can't sustain the print runs anymore and you have to cancel a series and maybe switch to like comiXology only. And we're not doing that. We're keeping this in print and we're pushing forward uh, just for that, those people who are hanging on and buying each one. Um, so thank you to everyone who's doing that. Without you, we'd have to cancel it. And so far, so good. We're running forward. It's a great series. Um, and the trades allow you to jump on and then jump on issue 14. So volume two, available to pre-order now. Uh, other than that, there's, there's a bunch more, but I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, there's a new, brand new series called Yuki versus Panda. Uh, issue one. Now this is not, this is new to America. We'll put it that way. Um, this series is already blown up in the underground like uh, indie scene in Canada and uh, has already gone on for several successful volumes. And now we are putting it out into the, the bigger, broader world. And we're pretty excited and proud of it. Um, it's wacky and funny. And it's literally a panda bear trying to get revenge on a girl who as a child bit off part of his ear in a mishap at the zoo. So uh, I like to think that his family guys, uh, epic battles between Peter Griffin and the chicken. It's kind of like that, um, but in a big ongoing, huge epic series. So um, it's a ton of fun and we're all really excited. About I saw it. some animation associated with that. Yes, uh, there's actually a, uh, an animated series that is from what I understand, mostly complete um, and is, is currently like, in the ether of, of 
to be announced type stuff. Uh, but yeah, there is a trailer. We put it up on our YouTube channel just the other day for those who haven't seen it. And it's starting to kind of like make the rounds. Um, in fact, a big press release about Yuki versus Panda went out today where um, you'll probably see in, in the press tomorrow, there'll be some comic sites that are talking about it and showing off that trailer. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed that there might be an animated series on the way, um, which would be really cool um, for us, of course, and, uh, and hopefully fall in line with the other animated stuff we're working on in the background right now too. So whew, the next couple of years are gonna be very interesting. For us <laughs> yeah so much cool stuff so much so much cool stuff that you guys are putting out um josh warner i want to i want to thank you for being on inside comics and uh, i encourage everybody to uh go to your local comic book store and tell them to bring in source point press books thank you thank you so much for having me yeah absolutely peace dude take care